When you change the price of oil as dramatically as has happened over the last decade, you just don't change the speed at which you can drive your car, you change the speed at which your economy can grow. And I think that has some pretty major implications that most of our policymakers and governments have yet to understand. You see, skyrocketing oil prices are just part of the problem. Hi, I'm Rebecca Brayton and welcome to WatchMojo.com. And today we're speaking with Jeff Rubin about the end of growth. We're not going to be able to grow at the same pace that we have in the past. And not just us, I mean China as well. And the problem is that when we try to get the economy to grow at the old growth rates, either through zero interest rates or a trillion dollar budget deficit, we just make the adjustment to triple digit oil prices that much more difficult. And you can see the consequences of that if you look at countries like Greece and Spain right now. You mentioned that the world's economic order is shifting. Would you mind expanding on that? I mean, it's shifting to new economic powers, and the new economic powers are China and India. And what's allowed those economies to grow so rapidly is China was an economy that consumed 2 million barrels of oil a day. Now it's 10 million barrels a day of oil. The only problem is that oil supply is really not growing that quickly. So if somebody's like increasing their oil supply by five times, somebody else has got to cut back their oil consumption. Guess who that somebody else is? Us. And guess what? Our economies aren't growing. On the flip side, are there any countries that we can look to for positive examples of how to handle themselves? Japan. I mean, Japan is a country that a year ago got 30% of its power from nuclear. It's all but shut down 54 nuclear reactors since then. And guess what? You know, I mean, the, J the Japanese have managed to do that. And they've managed to do this through this program called Setsuden, Energy Conservation. And it means everything from turning off the power in the escalator and turning them into stairs, to shutting off the lights, to not wearing a suit, but some light clothing so you can turn down the office air conditioner. In other words, the things that have made it successful are not the decisions taken by the Ministry of Finance in Japan or the Central Bank of Japan. It's the decisions made by everyday Japanese. And it was a big lesson to be learned for that for the rest of the world. Denmark is a, a very interesting example. It's a country that has lowered its carbon emissions below its 1990 level, in complying, one of the very few places that have complied with its Kyoto commitment. But what's really intriguing about Denmark is that 80% of its power comes from coal. And that's the exact same percentage as China. Only China's carbon emissions are soaring. They've even overtaken the US. And Denmark's emissions plummeted. Why? The answer is not the source of power. It's certainly not about the 20% of power that comes from windmills. It's about the price of power. It costs 30 cents per kilowatt hour to get power in Copenhagen. What does it cost here in Montreal? Five, seven cents? Well, guess what? Like if Montrealers had to pay 30 cents per kilowatt hour, you too could reduce your carbon emissions without building a single windmill. The outlook is not entirely bleak. There were some silver linings. Uh, would you mind telling us about them? Yes, one is we're not going to be able to afford to cook ourselves to death. I mean, if you look at, you know, what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is forecasting in terms of carbon emissions, in terms of coal and oil consumption in the next 20 years, assuming that China and India are going to double their coal consumption, I'd like to ask those climate change modelers exactly what price do you think China is going to be paying for its coal when it doubles its coal consumption? Because coal is already well over $100 a ton. And I think what you'll find is that if you put in realistic assumptions about coal prices and oil prices that we're not going to emit half of the carbon that the IPCC says we are, not because of you know, ecologically conscious governments, it's just we're, we're going to not be able to afford the fuel. So for people who are concerned about what we're doing to the sustainability of the planet, for people who are concerned about you know, temperature increases that could totally devastate our environment, I think this is a very hopeful story because it takes the future out of our hands. Thank you very much. Thank you.